Good evening and welcome to the 6 p.m. service. Um, I believe the Lord has led you here and he has a message to encourage you with the third commandment that we're going to look at tonight. And you're looking up at screen right now and you're thinking, well, that's a weird way to start a third commandment series. And you would be uh, accurate. I, I hope it doesn't come off as too offensive. But if you look very closely, the name of the business it's called The Blind Man. He sells blinds to people's homes. And so I just started giggling and had a huge laugh over this guy as his advertisement. And it makes sense, right? Because um, it's a blind man. I mean, in terms of, boy, that gets your attention. And so what I wanted to bring up today is we're, we're going to do what I'm going to call bumper sticker theology a little bit today. This is also my favorite Far Side comment uh, cartoon I've probably ever got of all of his. I still laugh every single time I look at it. Um, but what ended up happening is as I was trying to come up with a way to teach the third commandment and I was looking and wrestling with it, I saw a bumper sticker. And there's a bumper sticker that just got me to a point to really reflect on how this idea plays out in our modern day age. And so I came up with four bumper stickers that we're going to get into in just a little bit. And I'll explain a, a lot more detail when we get to them. But we're going to talk through four bumper stickers because bumper stickers give one idea really fast in like one quick suggestion. And so when we get into the third commandment, we'll talk through four different bumper stickers and apply it to us today. So if you've got your pew Bibles, the black ones in front of you, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20. It's on page 55 of the Pew Bible, um, or if you've got it on your phone, on a tablet, or on your own personal Bible. It's a very short, it's one verse tonight, but it's going to be Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And I'm going to throw it up here on screen here as well. This is from the NASB version. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, the third commandment says this, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him or the person unpunished who takes his name in vain. When I really started studying into this, the NSB gets it really close, but I think it mis kind of emphasizes a few things. And so looking into the Hebrew, a little bit more literal translation would be this. You shall not take the name Yahweh. You shall not take Yahweh, which is the name that was given to Moses. You shall not take Yahweh, the name of your God, in vain. For Yahweh will not leave the person unpunished, he who takes the name, the name Yahweh, in vain. Because when we read the commandments, sometimes we miss over the fact that he's not just saying God. We use God in English for all the terms of God, but he's actually very specifically calling out the name Yahweh. Do not use the name Yahweh. Yahweh in vain. Well, what does it mean to take something in vain? And that's kind of like the crux of this passage, or so it would appear, is what does it mean to take Yahweh's name in vain? Well, I spent way too much time going down rabbit holes on this one. But the long story short is there's four synonyms, four ideas, and that's where we're getting to the four bumper stickers, of what to take a name in vain would mean. The first is in emptiness or in cussing. The second is in a false oath. The third is in, a, it's called futility or basically begging. And then fourthly, it's going to be deceitfulness. So we're going to see these four ideas, emptiness, false oaths, futility, and deceitfulness through four different bumper stickers. But before we get to that, we're going to go a baseline. Baseline bumper sticker, Jesus Christ is Lord. I am presuming if you're in church here, you're a believer, you're a Christian, and you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I love it whether you believe or not, right? I, I would hold to that statement. And so we're coming from that, and it's Jesus Christ is Lord. And this first bumper sticker is the bumper sticker that completely gave me an idea of how to emphasize this passage. And the very first way we can take Yahweh's name in vain is by cussing. Obviously, I can't put a cuss word up there. So I put this one up there. And if you know what that means, you know that's a cuss word. Now, 
I reason I put this one up there is I was driving one day and I saw someone had a Jesus Christ is Lord and they actually had the vulgar term of this on their bumper. And I looked at that and I went, wait a second, you're proclaiming Jesus as Lord, but you're also publicly declaring a swear word. That seems a little odd. How can you proclaim one and the other at the same time? And so it got me going on, you know, um, but the reason it kind of hit me home was because for about six or seven months, I had a coworker that every morning, he was a committed Christian, goes to church, he leads Bible studies, and every morning he came into my office and he said, good morning, let's go. And I was like, doesn't that seem wrong? He said, oh, it's just a, for fun. Like, well, you are swearing, aren't you? Oh, I know what it means, but I'm just having fun with it. So I asked coworkers, isn't that a problem that a Christian should be swearing publicly? Oh, it's fine. It's for fun. No, no. We, we have to hold ourselves to higher standard. Um, do you know in our culture, cursing and using the Lord's name in vain is kind of acceptable? Have, how many of you have watched a movie recently? And have they used Jesus Christ in a derogatory term? I always find it fascinating, and this is my observation. When was the last time you watched a movie where someone stubbed their toe and they said, Buddha, dang it. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? I, I haven't heard that. Or Joseph Smith. <laughs> you know? Oh, Muhammad, dang it. Vishnu. Oh, Vishnu. Why is it culturally acceptable to use Jesus Christ or God or Yahweh as a swear word? And uh, I think most of us, when we read this passage, that's how we interpret the passage. We're going to go much deeper in it. But my wife had actually posted up. She's like, what do you do? Because I you know, work now in a different company, a different culture. And what do you do when one of your coworkers says, Jesus Christ, as a swear word? I said, well, I usually do the same thing what I always do. Mary and Joseph. It catches them off guard every single time. He's like, what? I said, oh, I thought we were doing the whole holy family gets the whole point across, right? Or the other one I do is when someone shouts out Jesus Christ in a curse word, I'll just say, is Lord, hallelujah. They look at you like you're insane. They're like, what? I said, oh, I thought you were preaching a sermon. I, and they get the point without me actually having to school them. And usually what ends up happening is fairly quickly after doing that two or three times, they say, after they swear out with Jesus Christ or something else, they say, oh, sorry. I, oh, sorry. And I can be a light of change. Because let's not... As Christians, Paul writes, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This would be unwholesome talk. And I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm trying to make the intention behind it is a swear word. And so let us be careful what what curses or swear words or uses of God come across our mouths because we literally are dragging his name through the mud. Now, I wish I could say I'm perfect, Any of you ever stubbed your toe at midnight? Yeah. Things come out of my mouth at midnight with a stubbed toe that I wish they didn't come out. So the first one is is cussing and using the Lord's name in vain in that way. The second way is to swear false oaths. And I thought this was a good bumper sticker um, here, which is swearing we're going to do something, but we invoke God's name to give it emphasis. Listen to the difference here. It's, it's like if a kid comes up to you, if one of your children come up to you and says, hey, you say, hey, take out the trash. He says, mom or dad, I'm going to take out the trash. Okay, and then they don't and there's discipline. But if they walked up to you and said, mom, dad, I swear by God, I'm going to take out the trash. Do you see what they're just doing? They're invoking his authority, his power, his character into an oath. This happened in the Old Testament uh, multiple times, but we see it where people in the Old Testament would swear by the temple. They would say, I'm going to do this, but I swear by God, or I swear by Yahweh, or I swear by the temple as a way to invoke God's name, God's power in it. And I thought Matthew 5, it's a good verse to live by. Jesus says, let, you, what, let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more comes from evil. We are supposed to live lives that we don't go around swearing using God's name to add emphasis 
to our statements. We're supposed to live lives as Christians in such a way that when I say I'm going to do it, I do it. And I don't need to invoke God into it or invoke his character, his being, his presence into that. We shouldn't need to swear by anybody or anything. So the first one is cussing. The second one is swearing an oath or invoking God's name. And the third one, this is also true if you've got any kids in high school, is the, the idea of we can use God's name in vain when we bargain and we beg. Now this one's a little bit farther out there, so let me explain a little bit. Is Sometimes we come to God, we believe that if we just say the right words, we pray it hard enough, or we offer the right thing, then God is going to answer for us. What I want to point out is, which is a really cool kind of history thing I thought was cool, is in the ancient Near East times, all of Israel's neighbors, if you wanted God to answer your prayer, you had to make sure you said the right formula. Listen to one of the initial prayers of the Hittites. This is how they were trying to get the right formula in order to get God to act. O oh, wise God, perceivable creator, lofty prince, person of the rivers, the one who is artful and venerated, the sage of the waters, the bringer of high abundance, the one who gives us great abundance, who makes rivers joyful in the oceans and the reeds. You are prosperous in the meadows. You create livelihood. It goes on for legitimately a whole page, and I'm not going to bore you with the page of invocations, but they're trying to get God to act by getting the right words. What's crazy is if you look at Israel, Israel does the exact same thing every single time. O oh Lord, you are God of Israel. You're enthroned in heaven. You're the king of the earth. Help us. These other our enemies have thrown down their gods and have destroyed them. Help us. And it says, Lord, our God, deliver us from the hand of our wicked, evil people so that everybody of the earth may know you are God alone. In the ancient times, all of the prayers that they found, they spend pages trying to invoke God and begging God. If you look at every prayer of Israel, it says, God, you're good, gives you about one sentence declaring God's goodness because they assumed God was good and going to answer, and then they just give the issue. We, as believers, can fall into this, where we try to pray again and again, and we're just trying to get the right words, when God already knows what's going on in your life, God already knows what you need, we don't have to beg and hope that he comes to him. We can just come and say, oh Lord, help. Jesus said in Matthew 6, when you pray, do not babble like the pagans, for they think that by their many words they will be heard. We use God's name in vain, when we just keep babbling and hoping that we get the right formula rather than trusting in his character, in his goodness, in his grace. So ask when it comes to him. And then the third one, or the last one, the fourth one, this is my personal pet peeve, although it's kind of funny. <laughs> my coworkers do say this all the time. Oh, it's karma. You better not do that. It's karma. It's karma. It's like karma's like this mysterious ghost like creeping up behind me and going to attack me one day, right? I don't believe in karma, in case you were wondering. I don't believe in universal energy. But we can use God's name in vain when we promote falsehoods. Karma is a falsehood. The universe does not, if I give bad into the universe, the universe doesn't give bad back. The Lord stands as judgment over it. Jesus warns us, watch the deceptive teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees because in the Old Testament, if you've read the Old Testament, every time the Jewish people taught a falsehood like, hey, you need to sacrifice your kids to an idol or you need to bow down to the worship an idol, they fell underneath the judgment of God. They disdained his name. They used his name in vain. I found it super interesting. We were just at a party last, can I say party? We were at a gathering for a birthday yesterday. Um, but we were at a gathering yesterday, and we were just chit-chatting. People were introducing to our baby for the first time, and they were like, what's her zodiac sign? And I was like, I don't know. What's a zodiac sign? They're like, well, her zodiac sign. It'll tell you what she, her whole life's going to be like. And I was like, 
I couldn't tell you, I don't even know what my zodiac sign is. And so we got into this whole dialogue. And unfortunately, I wish I could have like in that moment stood up and been like, I'm a Christian. Zodiac things are crazy. And I was like, no. Well, they figured out her birthday and told us her whole life story. So now we know it because the stars have aligned. But do we believe in falsehoods? Do we believe in and do we practice them? Do they slip out of our tongues? In that sense, we profane God's name. Because God isn't into falsehoods. He's into truth. So, how do we take God's name in vain? We take God's name in vain when we curse, when we use his name when we swear oaths, when we try to bargain with him, and when we promote falsehoods. And I was talking back in the booth, like, where are you going with this sermon? All of those, if you just caught all four of those, those are behaviors. They haven't actually addressed the heart issue of this passage. Focusing on how we take the name, Lord of the, na- the name of Yahweh in vain is focusing on the behaviors rather than the actual action. So I'm focusing to see in the rest of the sermon, we're going to focus on that word. Taking. What does it mean to take Yahweh's name? Because we can take Yahweh's name, we can take God's name in a good way, or we can take his name in such a way that we tarnish his name. You see, name is identity. How many of you have got kids? Okay. Naming a kid is hard. Like, legitimately. Right? My, my wife and I had this, we had nine months, right? And he was like, people were like, what's her name? What's her name? We're like, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Like, you're seven months pregnant. Yeah, we still don't know. Eight months. Why is naming so hard? Because a person carries it for life. And a name speaks of identity. Now, just uh, this is a completely aside from what I'm talking on, but have you ever wondered why when we get to heaven, we, it, Revelation says we get a new name? And I always think it's fascinating. Could it be because I've been given my name Thomas and I've lived that identity, but when I get to heaven, God gives me a new name that gives me a whole new identity. Now, I can't say that. That's a conjecture. I don't know. But I just find it fascinating that we, it's, Revelation says we get a new name. But a name carries weight. Don't tarnish a family's name. I, I, uh, Amy Pye wrote this. She says, we show honor and respect to people when we call them by their name. It affirms who God has created them to be. A loving name affirms somebody's unique qualities as one created in the image of God. Names carry weight. You all have a name, and it carries weight. In the old times, right, people would be like, don't dishonor my name. Like, my, na- my, my word is good in my name. 400 years ago, this guy just passed away. If you remember last week, for those of you who were last week, right? Shakespeare passed away 400 years ago. I was like, ah, oh, let's throw back to Shakespeare. We pulled him in last week. Let's pull this one. What is in a name is a famous quote from Shakespeare and as Hamlet would say, well, that, that is the question. And if you know the story of Romeo and Juliet, there's a famous scene where Juliet says this, O oh, Romeo, O oh, Romeo, why do you have to be a Montagu? Forget about your father and change your name. Or else, if you will not change your name, just swear your love to me and I'll stop being a ca- Capulet. And those of you who are Shakespeare's fans are like, you just slaughtered both of those. Forgive it, please. Is, not your, is it not your name that defines you? Because even if you were called by another name, you'd still be the same person. So Romeo, oh Romeo, give up your family's name. A name is what identifies us. Okay? Good, good question. When you hear the word Kennedy, does an image come to mind? Okay. 
Okay, for those of you younger, when you hear swift, something comes to mind, right? Okay, how about Morgan Freeman? Does a name, a voice, an image come to mind, right? Names have power. How you name something brings associations that come with it. I'm not a car person. I, could, I, I like cars that run and get me from point A to point B. That's all I can tell you. Toyotas are awesome. They're reliable. They're cheap. They're good. Does anybody know what car that is? Ferrari. How do you know that? The horse, the crest. Is it, it's a cheap car, right? <laughs> no, no. Is it better built than every other car in the world? I don't know. I've never driven one, but I'm going to say no, right? <laughs> but isn't there a prestige that comes with that shield and that title? Did you know, this is fascinating because Justin Bieber got um, his, his Ferrari repossessed by Ferrari. Because Ferrari, in order to buy a Ferrari, you have to apply and qualify to be good enough for their standards. And you may never resell a Ferrari without their permission because they want to make sure that the only people who get out of a Ferrari show power and prestige. You may not repaint it, you may not change the color of it, you may not change any detail of it without their written permission because the price is in the name. The name, and they don't want somebody to drive it who would dishonor the name. When it comes to bumper stickers, one family member can ruin the name of a family. We take on the name Christian. Another way to say that is Yahweh, sons of Yahweh, sons of God. We are adopted as his sons, and we are adopted into his family. We are taking on the name of Yahweh. First John says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we are called children of God. It's who we are. If you are born again, and you got a new family name as Christian, are you living up to that name? Or are you using it in vain? Are you dishonor dishonoring it by our words, by our deeds, by our lifestyle, by our bumper stickers? If we're not careful, we can use God's name in vain. We can take God's name in vain by swearing. Swearing false oaths, treating him like a magician and begging him, or giving false teachings. Do you see that shift? Is if I take the name of the Lord in vain, it's saying I'm taking on his character, I'm portraying him to the world, Am I doing it well? If we take on the name Christian, another way to say this is Yahweh's child, are we reflecting him well? I don't know if you guys have watched the show, The Chosen. I, I can't actually say if it's really good or not. I haven't watched the whole thing through. But I think the reason people love the series, Jesus is happy. When I talk to people that have loved the series, they're like, Jesus is a happy Jesus, and I've never pictured him that way. And it changed people's ideas of what Christianity could be. Now, again, I've not watched the whole series. I've watched one episode and, and then I moved on. Um, but of the ways we act, do we spoil God's witness on the earth? <laughs> I put it down this way. The way you're acting or the way I'm acting, would my mother be ashamed of me? Would the pastor be ashamed of me? Would God be ashamed of me? I want to give a story here of two Jewish sons in the 1800s to hit this home and then we'll, we'll end with a conclusion here. In the 1800s, there were two Jewish brothers who migrated, uh, emigrated pardon me, to the United States and they went into business together they decided to sell meat in the local meat market. 
And over time, they were able to save up enough that they were able to bring their father over and their mother over as well. Now, their father and mother were elderly, and they didn't have work. And so they asked their dad, would you come and just sit in the shop and just be our greeter? Just welcome everybody in our shop. And he said, yeah, I'd love to. You're my boys. I'd love to come and hang out with you. So they cleared out a spot right in front of the big glass window out to the street, and they put up a little booth and a little table, and he sat there, and he welcomed every single person that came in. He wore his full Jewish garb with a beard and everything, and he really couldn't be missed. If you walked by, you just saw him in the window. Well, their market just, the meat market all of a sudden started increasing in sales, and it went booming and booming. They ended up hiring two, three more people, and they could hardly keep up with the business. Well, three or four months later, their dad showed up, completely shaven, wearing a normal button-down shirt and normal pants, took his seat by the door. Dad, what you doing? Just greeting people like normal. Okay. Sat there, greeted everybody as normal. Next day comes, kept clean shaven. And they thought, oh, maybe he just went through, you know, maybe he had something, he's going to regrow his beard. A month later, he's still sitting there, clean shaven, nice dressed. Every day they ask him, Dad, what's going on? He never said a thing. Finally, when they were just like, what the heck is going on? They went to their father's rabbi, who explained it this way. Your father realized that when people saw him sitting there in the shop, they assumed your meat was kosher. So they bought it with full confidence that the meat was kosher. And your father saw your sales increasing. The brothers knew, and they nodded. They had secretly known that this was the case. Well, their father's rabbi continued, when your father realized you were not selling kosher meat because they never claimed to be and just letting people buy it on assumption, he realized that you were trading on his likeness and you were taking on a kosher identity with actually, without actually following what God has commanded. Your father realized his physical portrayal of a Jewish man was leading others astray and he might be dishonoring God and leading others into sin. See, the, the sons knew what they were doing. They were using God's, their, their father's identity for personal gain. They didn't want to change, and instead, they wanted to borrow on their father's likeness and name to the world around them. How many of us are like them? We take on Yahweh's name as children of God, but we are not reflecting him well. How many of us are trading on his image and likeness while foregoing his commands to be Christ-like? If I take on Yahweh's name as a child of God, do I reflect him well? Do I avoid cussing? Do I avoid invoking his name because my word isn't good? Do I beg? Do I promote falsehoods? Because our witness is what people are seeing. We are taking on the, names, the Lord's name, and we don't want to do it in vain. The Lord said, do not take my name in vain. Yeah, it's one thing to cuss it. It's another thing is our reflection to the people around us. Do people interact with us and say, I feel loved? Not that we have to be perfect. Don't get me wrong. I'm far from perfect. But when you fail, do you apologize? Do you get back up and say, hey, you know what? Father, I did not reflect you well this week. I did not, in this situation, forgive me. Seek reconciliation and reflect his name well to the people around us. I think that is the heart of this passage. That is the heart of this commandment, is taking on the name of the Lord well and not doing it in vain. Let me pray. Father, you have given us the privilege and the honor and the position as your sons and your daughters. Help us live in such a way that we do not take your name as sons and daughters in vain, but we bear a good 
witness to those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.